Good day. This is the recorded lecture for Chapter 10, which is scheduled for Week 6. And it looks at conventional and sustainable farming practices. It's a good chapter to go right next to our discussion on food and hunger. This is a more um, mechanized look at uh, farming. And farming is basically a practice that converts land. And this is a more recent example, but humans have been converting land to agriculture for thousands of years. Some of these agricultural landscapes are ecologically sustainable and have lasted for centuries or millennia. Others have depleted soil and water resources in just a few decades. What are the differences between farming practices that are sustainable and those that are unsustainable? What aspects of our current farming practices degrade the resources we depend on? And in what ways can farming help us restore and rebuild environmental quality? In this chapter, we look at these things. But we start with farm production, and then we look at how we use and abuse farm resources, and then look at some alternatives. Your book talks about the case study of Brazil Cerrado, which is a savanna area in uh, eastern uh, Brazil. Enormous farms have been carved out of this area, which was once the most biodiverse grassland and open tropical forest complex in the world. Brazil is now the world's top soy exporter, shipping some 50 billion, million metric tons per year, or about 10% more than the United States. So compare that to the great uh, breadbasket areas of the United States, and you get an idea of the scope. With two crops per year, cheap land, low labor costs, favorable tax rates, and yields per hectare equal to those in the American Midwest, Brazilian farmers can produce soybeans for less than half the cost in America. Agricultural econo economists predict that by 2020, the global soil crop will be double the current 160 million metric tons per year, and that South America could be responsible for most of that growth. In addition to soy, Brazil now leads the world in exports of beef, maize or corn, oranges, and coffee. This dramatic increase in South American agriculture helps answer the question of how the world's growing human population can be fed. So this is a map of the Cerrado, just kind of showing you. Um, this area called the Arc of Destruction is where these grazing um, farmers have kind of moved into the jungle um, tropical forest areas of Brazil and are now cutting down that area to support their grazing uh, lifestyle um, and subsistence when they couldn't support it in the Cerrado, which is now being converted to mechanized farming. This uh, Google Earth display in the far right corner shows you one of these areas in the Cerrado that has been converted to soybeans. So the important place to start is look at, look at soil. Basically, we depend on soil to grow our agriculture, agricultural crops as we know it. Now, there's some very techno types of solutions coming on board. Uh, you've probably heard of um, hyponics, and you've probably heard about aer aer aeroponics, various ways to grow plants without soil. But generally, most of the world is dependent on soil-based agriculture.
So we have to understand soil. So plants have to obtain water and nutrients from the soil. And water, air, and nutrients have to be available in a form that the plant can actually use it. So in terms of soil, there are three types, components of soil, three mineral components, components of soil. We call that sand, silt, and clay. So when it comes to water, sand is not able to hold water for very long. Silt can hold some water, and clay can hold lots of water. When it comes to air, sand creates good air pockets. Silt creates some air pockets, and clay creates no air pockets. So you can see the balance between sand proportion, silt proportion, and clay proportion become important in the way that plants can obtain water and air. And of course, nutrients is related to that because nutrients are basically dissolved in the water. And the question is, is soil a renewable resource? Or it is, a, is it a finite resource that we are depleting? And the answer is that it's both. Over time, soil is renewable because it develops gradually through the weathering of bedrock and through the accumulation of organic matter, such as decayed leaves and plant roots. But these processes that produce soil are extremely slow. Building a few millimeters of soil can take anything from a few years, for example, in a healthy grassland, to a few thousand years, for example, in a desert or in the tundra. Under the best circumstances, topsoil accumulates at about one millimeter per year. With the careful management that prevents erosion and adds organic material, soil can be replenished and renewed indefinitely, which explains why some farmlands have been maintained for millennia. But most farming techniques, in particular some of the more modern ones, deplete soil. Plowing exposes bare soil to erosion by wind and water, and annual harvests remove organic material, such as leave and root, leaves and roots, that would uh, build the soil. Severe erosion can carry away 25 millimeters or more of soil per year, far more than the one millimeter that can accumulate under the best of conditions. So when we look at nutrients, we've talked about water and soil, water in soil and air in soil for the most part, and how nutrients are dissolved in water to get to plants. But there's another uh, aspect to nutrients. Sand and silt are chemically inert, so they don't have the capacity to actually provide nutrients to plants. Clay is chemically active and can provide nutrients. And organic matter is chemically active and can provide nu nutrients. So highly productive soils have the right combination of sand, silt, and clay for air, water availability, and also water drainage, and organic matter for plant growth and nutrition. The term used to describe good soil is a combination of soil texture and structure. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, the or, or origin of soils is rock, and it can take eons to create soil from native rock. So I just want to review here um, that soil is really a marvelous, complex substance. And it's a combination of weathered rocks, plant debris, living fungi, bacteria. And it's really an entire ecosystem that is hidden to most of us. So this, there are six components of soil that are important. Sand and gravel, as I said, mineral particles from the actual, that actually come from the bedrock that either in place or moved from elsewhere. Silts and clays, these are extremely small mineral particles particles, and clays are chemically active, they're sticky, and they hold water and nutrients. Dead organic matter, which is dec decaying plant matter, soil, fauna, and flora, which work that matter, 
water, which is moisture from rainfall and groundwater, and air, tiny pockets of air that help provide the source of oxygen for both the living components of the soil and also the plant roots. The, the variations in these different components produce the infinite variety of the world soils. Abundant clays make soil sticky and wet. Abundant organic material and sand make the soil soft and easy to dig through. Sandy soils drain quickly, so they are often deprive the plants of moisture because the water drains too quickly. Silt particles are larger than clays but smaller than sand, so they aren't sticky and they don't get soggy and they don't drain too quickly. So silty soils are almost ideal for growing uh, crops, but they're also light and they blow away easily when exposed to wind. Soils with abundant soil fauna quickly decay leaves and roots, making nutrients available for new plant growth. Compacted soils have few air spaces, making soil fauna and plants grow poorly. So now you, can, you have a sort of a idea of the complexity of soil. So this is a diagram that gives the relative sizes of soil particles, sand, silt, and clay. So you can see how they relate to each other. And you, you've probably played with sand, so you kind of have an idea of the particle size of sand. Um, silt, if you actually use a screen with the particle size that is shown on this slide, and you separate the silt portion of the soil from the sand portion. It really feels like powder, um, almost feels like a talcum powder or makeup powder, um, so you can get an idea of how small silt is. And clay is literally microscopic. You, you really can't uh, see it. So we talked about the ideal soil. This is a soil texture chart. And we rate soils based on their proportions of sand, silt, and clay. And if you read the graphs, you can see the relative proportions and how we classify different soils. So the ideal soil for growing is a loam. You can see the loam right in the middle there. And it's rel relatively equal portions of sand, silt, and clay. <clears throat> so loamy soils have the best texture for most crops. Um, the reason why this is, and I hinted at it in my previous slide, is that you need the soil needs to be um, loose and workable enough, both for growing and tilling, also for plant roots to get through the soil. But they have to be sticky enough with the clay portion to retain water and nutrients. Now the reason why clay is so important is depicted in this uh, diagram from another uh, class, another textbook that I use. Um, we talked about the, pol the polarity of biological molecules in water, uh, with water in the earlier chapters. And clay kind of works the same way. It's a, a polar molecule. And this means that ions are going to stick to clay particles and water uh, molecules are going to tend to stick to clay particles. So this is why clay is such an important part of uh, the component of soil. The ability of a soil to provide nutrients to plants is, is measured um, by its ca cation exchange or its ion exchange capacity. You've probably heard that organic matter is so important to soil. And the reason is um, not only does it provide a source of, of nutrients for biological activity and its you know, presence requires you know, decomposers and sort of builds the soil, um, the soil matrix and the living soil that is so important. But the other way to think about organic matter is that it behaves a little bit like clay. It's a polar 
has polar properties, and so nutrients stick to organic matter as well. So if you have a really sandy soil, organic matter is the cure for that. Yes, clay is better, but um, or just better to have in your native soil. But if you don't have it, uh, organic matter um, serves the purpose. This is another diagram that I think is useful to illustrate about the properties of soil that I've talked about on the previous slides. This diagram shows how soils are structured at smaller and smaller scales. The key to soil productivity is texture, sand, silt, and clay, and the proportions of it, but also structure, is how those uh, proportions sort of create soil structure, or the other term for that is aggregate. So soil will tend to kind of clump in, in clods, small clods, platy clods, big clods, tiny clods. Um, and that's structure. So you can see that from the first part of the diagram, A, that macro aggregates, these are small soil clods, they're roundish, are easier for plant roots to penetrate. If you take a portion of that, that box, and you blow it up, and you you can look at the micro aggregates. Root hairs, fungal bodies are important parts of a healthy soil. If you go even smaller in C, you can see silt particles and debris, and you begin to see the air pockets that are important for soil. And then D, even smaller, you can see the clay uh, clay pieces, the clay humus pieces called clay humus domains. You can see microbial de um, debris. And you can see the small water retention spaces where water kind of sticks to those uh, clay and humus particles. And that's how soils actually retain water for uh, plant use between precipitation events. So soil is really an ecosystem. And soil ecosystems include numerous consumer organisms. They're depicted in this uh, slide. And there's a code in your book that gives you these uh, organisms. But they include all kinds of things, snails, nematodes, nematode-killing fungi, earthworms, centipedes, slugs, soil fungi, soil protozoans, ants, mites, and all kinds of things. So soils are actually living spheres. So the degree to which a soil is alive is important to its health. And in agricultural practices, because of the chemicals and the, the fertilizers we use, we often uh, sterilize these soils. So they're not as good for plant growth as you might think. So I like to use earthworms as an example of how a living soil works and how soil ecology works. So this is the typical earthworm that you may know. You may use this, see this earthworm uh, when it rains up on the soil surface or the pavement surface. surface. And you may use these uh, earthworms if you fish. These are the same earthworms um, that you use for bait, called night crawlers. The actual scientific name is Lumbricus terrestris. It's an introduced earthworm. So there are three types of earthworms that you find in soil. Um, and they have three different uh, names. The leaf litter or compost dwelling earthworms are called epigeic. The topsoil or subsoil soil dwelling earthworms are endogeic. And the worms that construct permanent deep burrows through which they visit the surface to obtain plant material for food and then take it back down are the anesic earthworms. And this is what the Lumbricus terrestris, or nightcrawler, actually is. 
The application of chemical fertilizer sprays and dusts can have a disastrous effect on earthworm populations. And these deep burying earthworms are particularly important because what they do is they come up to the surface, they take plant matter, they drag it down deep into the mineral parts of the soil, you know, two or more feet down. In the process of doing that, they build burrows. Those are air carpet pockets for plant roots, and they aerate the soil. And so they're quite important to working the soil. This is our um, native earthworm, Argophyllus marmoritatus. So the previous earthworm, our night crawler, was introduced. And generally, you can find our natives in undisturbed native habitats. Um, the natives. Uh, hold their own in undisturbed grassland and oak savannas that we find in the Bay Area, for example. And they are less metabolically active, and they don't enrich the soil quite as much as our exotic earthworms that we've brought in. Because our native soils are, tend to be drier and le uh, leaner types of soils than the uh, earthworms that came in from the, the rich farmlands of Europe. So again, this is a, an, another look at these three types of earthworms. And on the right here, you can see a deep burrow of an, an anisic earthworm, or a deep burrowing earthworm. So the um, So a little earthworm history, I think, is um, interesting to look at. As I said, uh, the nightcrawler is not native. Um, in the northern part of North America, that's the northern part of North America, the last ice age stripped the country bare of earthworms. So there were very few areas of what now is the uh, northern portion of the United States where agricultural lands were rich enough to support um, human populations before Europeans arrived. Then the colonists arrived and wedged into the shoes of the colonists' um, horses were these tiny egg capsules of these European earthworms, like uh, the nightcrawler. And in the root balls of the plants that we brought over. So one idea is that the introduction of these earthworms into the native soils with these new plant products and with uh, on the boots of our settlers um, increased the fertility of our northern North American soils. So that's kind of an interesting history. Um, the, what these earthworms do, as I showed you in the previous diagram, is they burrow down deep and they pull plant matter down into that mineral soil. They create a lot of air um, pockets. And then they excrete worm castings, which is very high grade and particularly high in uh, phosphorus, which is generally limited in soils. So these anisic earthworms are kind of important to soil fertility. And one way you can uh, check how uh, fertile your soil is, you can actually do an earthworm test. You can take um, a small area, about a foot square, and dig a couple of inches down. And you can take um, some relatively fresh, dry mustard, two tablespoons, and mix it in a gallon of water. And if you pour the gallon of water into that hole and let it sink down, and then you've got to wait for a little while, sometimes an hour or two, 
but if you get more than 10 earthworms up from that process, then you know you've got a pretty rich organic soil. So um, the importance of these earthworms are listed here on this, this uh, slide. When you come, when it's raining, and we're having a pretty dry year this year, but hopefully we'll get some rain soon. Um, when it's moist, these deep burrowing earthworms have to rise to the surface. They really can manage, you think that they're rising to get away from the water, but they're actually rising to the surface to, to uh, mate and migrate to new areas. Um, our earthworms, they're actually hermaphrodites. They have male and female organs on the same individual. So when they mate, they line up the female part with the male part. You can see them kind of reversed there um, mating in this slide. So they're rather interesting animals. So enough about earthworms. Um, and again, the earthworms are just one uh, part of the soil life that uh, creates like an active living soil. Let's look at uh, soils again as uh, complex ecosystems. So it takes eons to create soil from rock. And then the particular climate that these soils are found in affect the type of soils that you develop. The U.S. Soil Conservation Service are now known as the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, has developed a soil classification system, much like we classify plants, um, that group soils um, based on their interaction of uh, these kind of soil development factors, temperature, rainfall, plant community, topography, and the soil organisms. So you can see mollusoils are generally the richer, uh, more uh, soils more suitable to agriculture. And then depending on where you live, you can get these other different types of soils. So intisols and alphasols are another type of uh, classification example. What happens is, depending on how dry it is, and depending on the precipitation regime, uh, rainfall will kind of work through these columns of soils, and they'll leach certain materials down to lower levels, and they'll create these different layers of, of soil. And how this is done kind of affects the quality of the soil, but also the type of soil that it is. So the upper soil layer is the most active with the organic matter, organisms, and inorganic materials, and we call that the A horizon. So as water leaches down into the lower soil layers, dissolved minerals kind of move down and they get trapped and they alter the composition of the soil. One of the types of soil issues that you may work, uh, work in as a gardener is a hard pan or a clay layer down below. Um, that's created by this sort of development of horizons that goes on in soils. So if you keep going down, you get this subsoil and this deep mineral soil, and then you get into kind of a mixture of soil and decomposed rock. And then ultimately, you'll get down to the original unaltered rock uh, surface. So ideal farming soils um, have a thick upper soil horizon, and we call that the A horizon. The soils that support the Corn Belt farm states of the Midwest, for example, have a rich black A horizon that's more than two meters thick. So the A horizon in most soils is less than half a meter thick. And desert soils, for example, with really slow rates of organic activity might have no um, A horizon at all. So this is a slide from another um, pres another book, just to give you an idea of how these develop. 
So the very upper layer we call the O horizon, which is all the surface litter in organic matter. And then the topsoil basically is the A horizon. It includes organic matter, humus, living organisms, and in organic minerals. And depending on how the water flows through the column of soil, you get these other horizons below. The E horizon, which is the zone of leaching, it's got dissolved or suspended materials that move downward. Then you get the subsoil, or the B horizon, which is accumulation of particular uh, minerals, iron, aluminum, uh, some of the humic compounds left over from decay. Clay will leach down and contribute to this uh, B horizon. Then you get into the C horizon, which is, again, a mixture of sort of rock and uh, partially broken down inorganic materials and, and soil in its sort of beginning stages, if you will. And then you get down to the bedrock. Now, some soil will not develop all of these layers. So now you kind of you have an idea of what soil is all about. I think the important points here are that soil consists of sand, silt, and clay, and then uh, living matter and organic matter. Um, soils produce a structure called horizons, and it's the topsoil or the A horizon that where we get most of our agricultural productivity if it's there. Only about 11% of the Earth's land area is currently in crop production. In theory, up to four times as much land could be potentially converted to crop land, but much of the remaining land is too steep, soggy, salty, cold, or dry for farming. So you can see how very little of our total land surface is actually what we call good arable land, that is crop land. In many developing countries, land costs continues to be cheaper than other resources, and forests and grasslands are still being converted to farmland. The best agricultural lands occur where the climate is moderate, not too cold or too dry, and where you can find thick, fertile um, soils. There's a global map in the back of your book. What regions do you think uh, of as the best agricultural areas, and which regions do you think of the poor? are the poorest. Much of the United States, Europe, and Canada are fortunate to have temperate climates, abundant water, and high soil fertility. These produce good crop yields that contribute to the high standards of living that we enjoy. Other parts of the world, although rich in land area, lack suitable soil, level land, or climates that can sustain good agricultural productivity. This is a quick chart just to contrast what we just talked about in slide one. Um, I showed you those micro aggregates, those macro aggregates. See how they're rounded? They were rounded in that previous slide, and they're round, rounded here. This type of soil structure is what makes a good soil. If you contrast with a poor soil on the left, you see how it, it it's sort of platy. You can just imagine that plant roots would have a hard time working its way through that. And so this idea of soil structure is really important to how the various soils around the world are either productive or not productive. So now we're going to look at how we abuse soils. Wind and water move soil over the land. And there are different kinds of erosion that can occur. A thin layer of land off the land surface moved by water is called sheet erosion. When little rivulets of running water gather together and cut small channels in the soil, the process is called rill erosion. When rills enlarge to form bigger channels or ravines that are too large to be removed by normal tillage operations, we call that process gully erosion. Stream bank erosion also occurs and refers to the washing away of soil from the banks of established streams, creeks, or rivers, 
often as a result of removing trees and brush along stream banks by cattle or by cattle damage to the stream banks. This figure, 7-1, from, again from another book, is sort of a cross-section of hill slopes. So water runs downhill, so you'll always have water sort of uh, rainwater that hits the crest of the uh, hill, and the water will run over the shoulder down the side slope and eventually make it to the this, this stream. What happens is the soils tend to be thin at the crest and particularly thin at the shoulder because that's where the slope is steepest. And then at the side slope, uh, soils will be thin and then they'll tend to, debris will tend to gather at the toe of the slope. Because of flooding from the adjacent creek or stream or river, there'll be a bottomland portion that gets flood uh, uh, silt and sand and uh, organic debris that floods into the bottomland. So often the good agricultural soils are found in these uh, bottomlands. This is a chart showing um, the United States and the acreage um, submitted to excess wind and water erosion. The red dots are excess erosion by wind and the blue dots are excess erosion by water. So each dot represents 200,000 tons of average annual soil loss. This is a chart depicting nationally the wind and water erosion levels and they've declined but the rate has declined since the 1980s but we continue to degrade our farmland. What we should be seeing there is almost no uh, bars in terms of tons of uh, soil loss there. This chart is, presents the global causes of soil erosion and degradation. So globally, 62% of eroded land is mainly affected by water and 20% by wind. Other ways that we affect the productivity of our soil is pesticide use. So every ecosystem has producers and consumers, but in an agricultural system, we do our best to simplify the ecosystem. Just one type of producer, the crop plant that we're interested in, and one type of consumer, that is us, humans. This means that other consumers, such as crop-eating insects or fungi, need to be controlled. Although deer are the single largest cause of crop damage in the United States, we spend most of our attention on controlling sm smaller crop pests, especially insects that attack crops. A pesticide is a general term for a chemical that kills pests, usually a toxic chemical, but sometimes we also consider chemicals that drive pests away to be pesticides. Some pest control compounds kill a wide range of living things and are called biocides. Chemicals such as ethylene dibromide that are used to protect stored grain or to sterilize soils before planting strawberries are biocides. In addition, there are chemicals aimed at a particular, particular groups of pests. So herbicides are chemicals that kill plants, insecticides kill insects, and fungicides kill fungi. But they are all considered different types of pesticides. The era of synthetic organic pesticides began in 1939 when Swiss chemist Paul Mueller discovered the powerful insecticidal properties of dichloral diphenyl trichloroethane, or DDT. Inexpensive, stable, and easily applied and highly effective, this compound seemed ideal for crop protection and disease prevention. DDT is remarkably lethal to a wide variety of insects, but is relatively non-toxic to mammals, 
could be thought. By the 1960s, however, evidence began to accumulate that indiscriminate use of DDT and other long-lasting industrial toxins was having unexpected effects on wildlife. This shot picture in your book um, is DDT being sprayed on beaches in the 1960s. But I actually remember these trucks going around as a small child. I spent my summers in Florida. And these trucks used to go around and spray DDT. I remember them looking just like this in these big clouds of DDT coming out. So um, these effects began to affect our large birds of prey, peregrine falcons, bald eagles, brown pelicans, and other carnivorous, carnivorous birds were disappearing from former territories in eastern North America, including you know, our national bird, the bald eagle. Studies revealed that eggshells were thinning in these species as DDT and its breakdown products were concentrated through food chains. So this is just a slide also that reviews the different kinds of pesticides that are used. This slide shows the relative type of pesticides of different kinds that are used in the United States each year. According to the EPA, total pesticide use amounts to about 5.3 billion pounds. 2.4 million metric tons per year. Roughly half of that amount is chlorine and hypochlorites, that is bleach, used for water purification. Eliminating pathogens from drinking water prevents a huge number of infections and deaths. But there's concern that using so much chlorine and hypochlorite to do so may be creating other chronic health risks. The next largest category is conventional pesticides, primarily insecticides, herbicides, and fungus, fung fungicides. This is the usage of the top five pesticides in the United States. All are herbicides applied to soleil corn, corn or wheat or to lawns except metamsodium, which is a soil fumigant used mainly on ground crops, such as carrots, potatoes, peppers, and strawberries. Pesticide use can expose consumers to agricultural chemicals. In studies of a wide range of foods collected by the USDA, the state of California and the Consumers Union between 1994 and 2000 73% of conventionally grown food has residue from at least one pesticide and we're six times as likely as organic foods to contain multiple pesticide residues. Only 23% of the organic samples of the same groups had any residues. Using these data, the Environmental Working Group has assembled a list of the fruits and vegetables most commonly contaminated with pesticides, and you can see the foods listed in Table 10.1. So let's look at organic and sustainable agriculture. Farming is remote for most of us, with some 85% of Americans living in cities. We eat foods that are grown far away, processed in anonymous factories, delivered by national gro grocery store trains to our tables. But a growing movement has been reclaiming food production for city dwellers. Urban farming, urban gardening, and community gardens 
are just a few of the names and strategies people in cities are taking to bring some of the, some of their food closer to home. You might want to look into Paul Roberts' book called End of Food. He talks about this issue. One of the leading examples is Growing Power, an organization formed in Milwaukee, Wisconsin by the former basketball player Will Allen, <coughs> who received a MacArthur Genius Award for his work. Like many older industrial cities, Milwaukee has seen, Milwaukee has seen declining population, housing values, incomes, and economic opportunity for decades. Low-income or unemployed minority groups make up an increasing proportion of the city. Young people have few jobs, few training resources, and little food security. Difficult conditions can make a fertile ground for a movement promoting self-sustaining food production. Will Allen brought together unemployed teenagers and other community members starting on just a two-acre plot of farmland. Allen's organization teaches kids and their parents to improve the soil with compost and mulch, to grow vegetables, tilapia, chickens, and other foods, to manage a business and sell food. Growing Power serves kids by teaching them skills and providing internships and paid employment. The organization serves the community by providing a positive focus that brings people together. Who doesn't like fresh food grown by friends? <coughs> the organization also serves the city by providing wholesome food resources that supports the health and food security of low-income neighborhoods. If you get Netflix, there is a great documentary uh, film on Will Allen's work, and it's called Fresh. This slide goes into looking at another alternative. It's called um, BT. Um, and BT is a, uh, actual, an actual bacteria that produces a particular type of protein that sort of crystallizes in the guts of larvae and prevents the um, larval stage from developing properly. And so the larvae can't produce um, the next generation. So uh, this is one area of a little bit more of a biological control that's used to control some pests. Um, your book continues on with some more uh, discussion of integrated pest management. So I'm going to let you take a look at the book. But um, this chart, I think, is interesting because in Indonesia has one of the world's most successful integrated pest management programs. They switched from toxic chemicals to natural pest predators and saved money. And have, but have, they've also increased production. In California, we have one of the best uh, pest management programs. In um, in the state, and in the U.S. probably. And so this is a web shot of its uh, of how you can get access to it. And if you have a pest and you're trying to manage a pest in your yard or in your garden um, much more organically, take a look at the site. They have what's called a pest note on all kinds of pests. And you can look at the most environmentally sound way to control a pest. So this um, soil conservation is also discussed in your book. And um, a number of issues are covered. One is looking at sustainable soil practices. And you can see some shots here that use have buffers to prevent wind erosion, um, terracing to, uh, is another technique to present to prevent erosion and work with more sustainable agricultural practices, 
Two of these shots present contour plowing, which uh, actually has the plowing work on the contour of the slope, so that prevents the water from running down um, and uh, causing more water erosion. And then finally, this is a compost pile um, in in the work. So composting is a great way to um, prevent some of your organic waste from going into the landfill, but also to bring it produce um, more uh, a way to renew your soil. Consumer choices will play an important role in all of this. So this is another way that that one person, an individual, can make a difference. Um, we talked about being locavores. We al also uh, talked a little bit about community-supported agriculture, farmers markets, and such. If you go to the San Mateo County website, there are a list. There is a list there of um, community-supported agricultural agreements that you might be able to enter in. Also, there's an, a number of creative places that you can visit in the Bay Area. One is called Pie Ranch. It's an organization that uh, looks at community-based farming and has classes, demonstrations, programs, and so on. I put the, um, the uh, website here for you.